Thank you and welcome to, to the 23rd session of the International IVF Initiative. I'm honoured and excited to be co-hosting the session at the I3, as we call it. For videos and previous sessions, please go to the website ivfmeeting.com. You'll also find information on upcoming sessions on that same page. Our continued goal, of course, is to provide educational opportunities while bringing our community together. It's great seeing so many people coming together, reproductive biologists reaching out from across the world. Thank you for logging in, listening, and please ask those questions. My name is Giles Palmer, and I will be co-moderating this session with Jacques Cohen. We have an amazing program planned for the next 80 minutes or so. The theme today is laboratory planning, maintenance, and engineering now and in the future. We have a talented team who are working behind the scenes to post those questions. I encourage you all to use the Q&A section and not the chat function of Zoom. Some questions will be addressed live and others will be typed in at the Q&A section. So over to Jack. Thank you, Charles, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to co-moderate this session on IVF laboratory design with Charles Palmer. We have a, a little change in venue today. We're experimenting a little bit today. The four lectures were pre-recorded during the last week, uh, some as recent as a, like yesterday or the day before. But all presenters are present live for our debate and Q&A after the lecture. So please uh, go to the, the Q&A uh, section and, and, and comment or ask questions as much as you like. Uh, Antonia Gilligan uh, is not available. She's in a remote area in upstate New York in the Adirondacks, and she has very poor bandwidth. And I've given the lecture uh, instead of her. Uh, and she's also not with us live today, so I'll be hopefully I can uh, uh, answer most of the questions directed to Antonia. And otherwise, I'll, we'll ask the questions to her directly. As you know, every Q&A uh, session, we have questions and answers, and answers are given by the panel, and we'll post those later, probably in a couple of days when uh, all the lecturers are ready with their, their answers. Okay, so let's get started, and I, I'm, I'm really happy to introduce our first speaker, who is also my co-moderator, Charles Palmer. Uh, Charles is one of the founders of our lecture series, Initiative I3, and his bio, as well as that of all our speakers, is available on the website, listed under session 23. Charles Palmer is a senior clinical embryologist. He's skilled in laboratory business and quality management. So he, he's wearing two hats. Charles graduated in genetics. He's a geneticist from Leeds University in the UK and attained a position as research officer at London's Hammersmith Hospital acclaimed IVF unit because he was working there with professors uh, Robert Winston and Alan Handyside. And so that's a fantastic start to an amazing career. He then went to Iceland and other places and he arrived in Greece where he lived at least, I think, 20 years. And he worked for several IVF programs there. But the, most, the, the, the longest position he held was at Matea Hospital uh, in Athens from 2002 to 2016. In Greece, he was the first to establish uh, pre implantation genetic testing. Uh, he has senior embryology status to, by, given by Ashra, and more recently has become a consultant and product developer in a wide range of areas within the industry, including clean room technology, quality management, risk assessment for clinics and cryo storage facilities, and to round it all up, artificial intelligence and art. And today, Charles will introduce our main topic and speak about what we know about IVF laboratory design. It is a pleasure to give a quick overview of some of the problems we are facing when designing, planning and renovating a laboratory. Um, before I start, I'd just like to go through some disclaimers and affiliations. Um, I'm an advisor for three companies, uh, Dittle Engineering and the Adriatic Institute of Technology, who make modular clean rooms, um, custodian, developers of RFID tags, uh, read within liquid nitrogen and AIVF, a company using artificial intelligence for IVF processes. So to begin with, um, laboratories in IVF were not purpose-built in the beginning. Um, there wasn't even purpose-built equipment in those days, uh, but that's another story for another time. Um, the first IVF laboratories, even in Bourne Hall, were from porter cabins. And until the early 2000s, most uh, art laboratories 
followed the design of surgical suites. Um, since then, there have been many changes, of course, in our working practices and lab design, but still many IVF clinics worldwide are in a variety of buildings, from medical facilities, commercial properties, to converted stately residential buildings. No lab is an island and must communicate or connect with other auxiliary rooms, adjacent or not, to create a functional unit dedicated to the culture of human embryos, uh, fed by medical gases, supplied by fresh or frozen samples, and operated, at least for now, by humans. To conduct the functions of assisted reproduction and all critical equipment, of course, has to be monitored 24-7. The entire IVF process is governed by the biology of gametes and embryos. The biophysical and biochemical requirements governs all IVF procedures and to no small part the design of the lab, uh, the air system, the engineering of the lab equipment and the materials used. So gametes and embryos must be protected against exposure to adverse external factors. Now we know urban areas contain high levels of pollutants such as carbon monoxide and other toxins. And even indoors, there's MDF uh, furniture, uh, PVC flooring, adhesives, and so on, which add a source to what we call volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. Besides that, there's other sources, such as cleaning fluids and waxes, which in, uh, in, other, in any other facility uh, would be commonplace, but of course not uh, in an IVF clinic. And because we are in an IVF clinic, we may have the dangers of anesthetic gas if that's used. And the worst contaminant of all, of course, is the embryologist. While early discussion of air quality was purely anecdotal, uh, this changed in 1997 when Cohen and co-workers showed that the labs could contain air worse than that from outside the lab. And compressed gas uh, can be found benzene, isopropanol and pentane within. Moreover, high levels of VOCs can be found to accumulate in the incubators, the very place that we don't want them. And Boone in 1999 demonstrated that controlling air quality in an art laboratory was beneficial to fertilization and embryo development. This has led to products such as inline filters for medical gases, standalone, standalone units to clean air being used in the lab, and handheld particle monitors and VOC counters uh, being introduced into the lab worldwide as part of the quality management. There's been some ingenious ways in which to uh, create a protected environment for the product. And the product in the IVF laboratory, of course, would be the pre-implantation embryo with isolates, um, isolators and laminar flow hoods. While Health and safety authorities have safe limits for VOCs for exposure to humans. Uh, there's nothing um, for embryos in vitro. Over the years, guidelines by societies such as the ASRM and ESHRA have updated many times their guidelines. But while recognizing air quality is a key factor, the specifics remain vague. Now, in 2004, the European Union wanted to bring in line cell and tissue handling to be in line with blood and organ transport and handling as well. And the central doctrine to this um, document was clean air. The surprise inclusion of the IVF industry caused quite a stir. Um, but to cut a long story short, the strict air quality requirements of grade A, as defined by the EU's good manufacturing practice, was reviewed and in a second technical appendix stated that a less stringent environment was acceptable, but didn't define this. And each member state made up their own interpretation. So, for example, in the UK, um, the HFEA, the UK governmental watchdog, states a uh, grade C working environment with a grade D background. And by 2007, all laminar flow hoods in the UK had to be class two hoods. Following on, more recent years, we have seen several papers illustrating lab improvements in air quality, um, helping the success rate within the clinic. 
Noteworthy are they all, but especially interesting is the 2013 study by Estevez and Bento, who have done a great body of work on this topic um, that showed in a nine year study, an increase in live birth rate was found with air improvements. And Heitman um, and colleagues in 2015 saw profound positive effects when describing the replacement of an old air system with an improved strategy using uh, UV light treatment and chemical filtration, stating improved implantation and clinical pregnancy rates. And finally, to prove there's no escape, uh, Wang reported fragmentation and delayed bladder cyst development associated with sulfur dioxide in the air from a clinic which was on the 23rd floor of a building. Now, your IVF program is only as good as a lab which it supports, and a good lab design can be the difference between a triumphant beginning with you hitting those KPIs and recording high success, or a lengthy and difficult road to recovery after a new build or renovation. Two pieces of literature that you simply must read uh, are the CARA Consensus published in 2018 from an expert meeting and the seminal book edited by Estevez, Vajiz and Warilo, which provides a wealth of knowledge explaining about air quality, um, especially a chapter by Estevez and Bento, who will provide a summary of evidence of the effect of lab air quality on, preg on pregnancy outcomes uh, in IVF. But it cannot be stressed enough that everyone involved in the, in the construction or renovation should read those two documents. Everyone should be involved, be reading from the same hymn sheet because it's so important. Everyone has to buy in to this, these, these ideals. So as I mentioned, with a growing body of evidence and with the diverse nature of IVF labs, um, this expert meeting in Cairo convened to establish a consensus on recommended technical and operational requirements with aspirational benchmarks. They looked at design, air handling, control of particles, the furniture, the cleaning and the VOC management. Um, they looked to minimise exposure to harmful compounds and listed the measured VOCs in both old style laboratories and more modern IVF labs. The most common uh, VOC they found was ethanol followed by isopropyl alcohol and then acetone. Comparing the old style labs in the suites which were built using clean room concepts, the difference was great. The total VOCs of the old style um, lab were four times higher than the VOCs found in the modern ones, as you can hit, see here by the figures in the left. There are 50 consensus points in this paper, um, and the message is to build laboratories with aspects of clean room design. Firstly, to assess the site's suitability, which will be addressed later on in this session. And while unan unanimously agreeing that great effort should be done for the art laboratory to have clean air, they recognise that the IVF lab has different requirements to those of those true clean rooms of other industries, such as um, pharmaceuticals and um, um, electronics. So while air quality should be ISO class 6 or GMP B to C type classroom, type clean room, the number of air changes required um, to give such a high level of clean room was excessive and possibly even detrimental to um, the practices of IVF. So the air changes per hour to be recommended in the in this study were between 10 and 15. And if we're talking about overpressure, the positive pressure uh, in, the, in the laboratories, the consensus um, reached the figures of 38 to 50 pascals. The permitted background grade of grade D under the EU tissue and cell directive was considered insufficient and a grade B in operation and C at rest should be targeted. And regarding VOCs, the total VOC level um, in the lab should be less than 500 micrograms per cubic meter. But also attention should be paid for uh, each VOC separately. And whenever thinking of constructing a lab, um, the clean room concepts should be put in place.
So in conclusion, and leading on to our session today, the laboratory environment and air quality is critical to the success of the IVF program. There are varied lab conditions globally. There's a variety of lab types globally, and there's a need for air quality and VOC standards to be implemented, of course, globally. Construction and renovation is disruptive and can introduce hazards into your practice. And finally, it warrants a professional process of designing, constructing and validating IVF laboratories. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you for this uh, bird's eye view of what's really a complicated task, establishing optimal conditions for IVF lab design. So now we can start planning for a new IVF lab or maybe renovate what is already in place. Okay, so what do we need? A budget? Yes, we do need a budget. We need to know how much we can spend, uh, definitely. And one or more possible locations to put the lab. What we need is a realtor, what we call that in this side of the Atlantic, a real estate agent. But most importantly, we need an architect. So who better than Chip Kalkani from Brooklyn in New York City to introduce this arduous task of design and product management? I've had the great pleasure of working with Chip on several IVF and laboratory projects in three countries. Chip has been involved in at least uh, 15 IVF projects and, and, and has a broad career in medical laboratory planning and designing other commercial and residential projects. His extensive bio as that of all speakers is also available on our website. His disclosures are also available there and that of all other speakers. Chip will speak about IVF laboratory planning, refurbishment, and new design, an architect's perspective. Hi, thank you so much for that uh, great introduction. I really want to thank the entire I3 team and the two moderators, Shock and Giles. There's a huge amount of work that's involved in the uh, International IVF Initiative, and uh, I'm grateful to them for the fine work that they've been doing. It's been educational for all of us. And, uh, and actually quite moving at this time in COVID. Um, my name is Chip Kalkani. I'm an architect in New York City, and I've done uh, work in IVF over the last 25 years all over the world. Currently, I work with Tomorrow Life Sciences, and I'm their VP of Biorepositories and Engineering. So that's my disclaimer. IVF has changed a great deal over the last 25 years. Uh, but one of the things that hasn't changed much is the requirements for clean air quality. Uh, the thing that's different now is that you can substitute sections and improve your air quality with your existing systems instead of having to buy a huge, uh, very expensive air uh, system. And, and that's gonna be talked about a bit by Tucker later on in the, in the presentations. Um, governmental groups are now sponsoring um, costs for people. so. Uh, IVF procedures aren't required necessarily for folks um, who can't afford it. There's a lot of manufacturing that's made particularly for IVF, but they still need outgassing, strangely enough, and a lot of them are fabricated uh, before they've had a chance to have volatile or organic compounds. It's very important to make sure that you bake them off and get a burn in for those equipment as well. Um, Vitrification is a central element in, uh, in IVF, and it's opened up all sorts of possibilities for patients waiting longer for treatment um, so that they don't have to do it when they're young. They can put their life uh, first and their baby second. Um, more and more automation's occurring, so uh, encouraging and, and working within uh, that as a design principle is important. And, um, are you pandemically prepared and, and how is that impacting your practice is going to affect the way we design a lot of the spaces in and around and, and it affects the flow. Um, I've been surveying spaces and Jacques has said that I can uh, survey a space in about five minutes. I disappear and run all over the place, but actually uh, the techniques that I learned were uh, honed by looking at houses and like a house, you want to first go to the basement and to the attic. And those are places that typically are unfinished. In an attic, you'll see how it's leaked. And in a basement, you'll see how it's, the foundation is 
how much uh, water damage has been down there. In addition, you also see all the plumbing and where uh, the electrical comes in. So likewise, you want to get below the space and you want to look at um, everything around it. So getting up onto the roof to see air supply, looking for shafts and spaces to get air up and down for your lab, and also um, having the ability to have enough space and having all the drainage work correctly is important. Um, checking your power requirements is a critical aspect as well because you want to make sure that you have adequate power and clean power that's uh, regularly provided for the space. Um, in order to circulate through the space and also get materials up and down, it's very, very important to check the elevator. Not to mention the fact that you want to be able, in an emergency, to be able to get somebody in and out. So the elevator size, its strength, and its location becomes critical to the entire sort of offstage portion of your um, of your practice. Uh, one thing that's really overlooked a lot is door sizes. The existing door sizes can prevent you from being able to take receiving of, of larger equipment and um, getting folks in and out efficiently. The last thing I'd like to, to bring up is look at the dark spaces in the plan. Your plan is like a map and um, those dark spaces are generally uh, populated with things that cannot be moved. So it's important to take note of those and not just assume that you can move them along and have everything work out. Um, I'm going to be going through a planning primer uh, through the next few slides to just talk about how um, the things that you need to know in the planning of your space. So to begin with, the on-stage elements begin with the exam suite. And the most practices are divided into the technical side with the laboratory and then basically an enhanced OBGYN suite with some uh, testing and a couple of other circuits. So the process of going from the waiting room into various levels of the exam rooms should be thought about in terms of the depth of how far people travel. If they're coming back repeatedly for uh, lab work, then they're going to have a very short distance, hopefully. And then also for the introduction to the practice and discussing procedures that are going to have to be done for new people just coming into IVF. Those should be the shortest circuit. And as you move through and uh, go through various exam processes, um, ultrasound and other, and other, uh, other types of, of exam processes, you're going to go deeper and deeper and then come back out. Um, so that whole aspect is pretty important to keep close to the waiting area. The second circuit off of the waiting area is the mail collection area, and it's better to have sort of a small waiting area that's a sub part of the major waiting area so that you can have that separate circuit of function um, where men uh, come and wait, particularly if they're not related to anybody but are, are just leaving sperm for donation. Um, they have their own private circuit that's still controlled by the same waiting people so you, you don't have uh, FTE, full-time employee costs associated with just maintaining that. And finally, uh, folks that are coming for their treatment to have retrievals and, um, and, and transfers done, that also needs to work off of the, the waiting room but in a different way. So there's really three hubs that come off of the, uh, the outpatient experience for the on-stage work. Um, Offstage is all the support stuff. This was sort of pioneered by uh, Disney, actually, having uh, support that you never see. A lot of it is underground in their cases. Um, for us, we want to make sure that there's a back door for staffs and, and, and physicians to be able to come and go as they need to without having to go through the waiting room as much as possible. Plus materials and consumables that outgas and create problems. You want to make sure they come through that back door as well. The lab entry, um, how you get scrubbed and clean people through and, and staff into the laboratory and out. And then particularly a space that you can undo all of your deliverables coming in cardboard containers, uh, which produce a lot of toxins, making sure that those are taken care of. And that comes through the back door as well as a really important app. Um, I like to think of the laboratory as a big balloon and that it's under pressurization. So I use that in terms of thinking about how all the holes and how the whole elements function within that balloon to keep it safe and under higher pressure than the rest of the area. Obviously, filtration is an issue, and Tucker, again, will be talking about that as well as Antonia Gilligan. Um, 
we want to have containers that are that you walk through which are um, ante rooms or vestibules around the laboratory and it's important to think of the procedure rooms as potentially vestibules as well so you want to try and encourage a, a, a design that allows people to enter into that vestibule the door is closed and then the door into the laboratory is opened to maintain that kind of high pressurization and keep your lab clean um, it's important to think about the lab if it's on the outside wall that Perhaps the, um, the exterior wall leaks, so making sure you've fully caulked that uh, is important. And also, the stairwells and elevators create air pressurization differences, so it's important to safe them off also with a vestibule or, or ante room as well. Uh, just by putting another door and a wall in uh, will help you contain that, that sort of problem. Um, Door swings are an important aspect in relation to those pressure differentials. So surprisingly, having a door swinging into the laboratory helps maintain that pressure differential better and is easier for an automated opener to work than if you swing it the other way. The high pressure makes it very difficult for it to close and you have to set it at a very high uh, rate, which creates slamming noises at some times. So it's better to try and, if you're particularly going to automate, put a door opener on it to have the door swing into the high pressure zone. Um, that's, that involves a certain layout strategy of making sure you're not eating up a lot of wall space. So it's part of the design um, aspect of that. Um, we want to try and use modular elements as much as possible to allow for change in the future, particularly as automated procedures are now going to start to take over the lab space. And um, uh, one of the early studies in 1997 um, that will be cited, I think, in some of the footnotes at the end of the procedure at the end of the presentations um, is just making sure that you're exhausting all of the spaces in and around the laboratory that contain materials and and putting a cycle that allows you to check those and outgas all of those in a heated environment over the period of a week before they're actually brought into the laboratory uh, one of the dirtiest elements is uh, liquid nitrogen. So how do we go through and making sure that we keep the liquid nitrogen separate in its own space? Um, so all of those cryo considerations become an issue, particularly uh, taking liquid nitrogen out and using it in, in the laboratory for vitrification and other aspects. So tracking that LN2 flow is a critical part of your planning. Um, typically, a lot of these uh, elements should be kept in their own sort of fireproof enclosure. That depends on the codes of where you're working. But the size of the area also becomes uh, an, an issue, not only for nitrogen gas, potential nitrogen gas buildup, but also the size, just how much space do you think you need to do to, uh, to properly house all of the elements that you're going to be freezing and responsible for. The whole, there's a whole on-site, off-site negotiation that's going on and discussions back and forth between different folks that do this work. Um, how much do you want to keep on-site and how much do you want to take off-site? Um, more and more you will find that there will be biorepositories available from various companies that will allow you to safely transition elements at 100 and minus 196 Fahrenheit to be able to take these things off-site. And so um, the process of how you maintain that also can be done all digitally now more and more. It's on paper. So a big question I'm always asked is how much will this cost? And I think those costs are really driven by the vision and the location and the design of the space. And ultimately, that needs to be driven by the visioning person who you can use the architect for, but it generally won't be as accurate as it will be if they're translating your design ideas and your kind of population and what they need and, and how you sell yourself. So um, uh, the costs tend to be one to two times, as many as three times as much for the uh, lab spaces versus the exam suite. So two thirds of the entire budget might be spent uh, in the technical areas versus the typical doctor suite that you'd have. 
And another point about uh, expenses is, are you the central core treatment area or are you going to have a series of treatment areas in the outside and will you be working as a hub and spoke and uh, with, with just the laboratory functions in one location and a series of referring spaces outside? What's your patient experience? How much homey? How much high tech? These are things that your vision needs to drive. And um, so uh, it's important for you to maintain that and declare that at an early stage with your architect to make sure that you're getting the kind of space that supports your care modalities. Um, I cannot overstress uh, the fact that construction materials are incredibly dangerous to um, an embryo toxic. So the process of how you build and, and how you do your burn in after that construction is really important. Uh, reviewing all of these elements with a sort of outline specification and then having a weekly meeting to make sure that the um, contractors are doing as you ask them to do is very, very important. I would say critically important with the air system because most contractors are not used to cleaning out all of the ductwork that's actually fabricated and bent with a lot of oil. So there's immediately the toxins that you've wanted to get out are part of that. So, um, and then checking and making sure that they're not just giving lip service to it, but actually doing it. So where is your lab? Typically when we're planning a, an IVF clinic, it's really important to place the laboratory first because it is the, um, it's the womb that your entire um, operation works off of. And it usually requires as much open spaces as possible, um, particularly if you have three or four micro manipulation stations that you're planning to put into the space. So you wanna have as few columns and finding that kind of special space requires that you think about it first. Um, how it's interconnected is also a critical aspect. So you minimize the need for corridors and you can use one space path to save another. Um, as well as your patient flow, which is a typical one for you to think about in the, uh, in the staff flow, you want to make sure that all your support flows are done correctly. The trash, the red bag, the, the, um, the uh, medical disposables, linen and consumables, how they come in and out and are, uh, don't pollute the, the space, as well as your enhanced new per patient information systems, which are increasingly becoming digital. All of these things affect the planning and you need to go through each of these flows with the architect as you're looking at the plans and reviewing the design. Finally, electrical power issues and, and uh, uninterrupted power supplies to make sure that you can keep more and more of this automated equipment at the right power all the time is part of your early survey. And, um, and one of the, the issues about placement, particularly on the roof between your air handler and your generator, making sure that they're uh, far apart from each other as, as possible and that you aren't polluting your own air stream coming into your lab. Um, it's very important, as I said, to put a lot of negative pressure in your storage area and workout protocols where you put the oldest materials to the back, um, and, uh, rather to the front, and put the, older, the newer materials to the back so that you can work through a process where materials can outgas for a week to two weeks in a heated. So how do you pick an architect? You don't typically work with one, and one that's specialized in IVF is hard to find. So you apply and ask for proposals, you'll get them back. And the first thing people look at, and I'm certainly as guilty as anyone, is what are the numbers that I'm getting back from these architects? But in fact, the entire preparation of that document has involved some good thought, or is it just boilerplate? And I think you can immediately see that if it's been tuned and tailored to your situation, it will reveal itself in the language that's used in it. Um, it's a great idea to tour your space with an architect because you'll get a lot of free information. It does involve a lot of time, but the time you put in, you'll find pays dividends with new ideas and ways of approaching the space. And make sure that you interview them afterwards to get information from them and just see what their reactions are. It'll give you real insight into what they think and what experience they have. Ask them to talk about IVF. Ask them to talk about the differences where the generator and the air handlers are. And if they don't have good answers, then you hire an expert to make sure that you do get the information that you need to. Does the architect talk a lot 
or is he actually asking questions and listening to the answers? Uh, that's a real important aspect, um, just in terms of your interaction and, and the absorption of, of information. Getting equipment designed quickly and early is really critical as well. You want to get that so that the planning process doesn't take longer. An architect produces drawings, so get references on the quality of their drawing work. It'll be really helpful to you later on. And do you like them? Because you're going to be with them an awfully long time. So how much do you like them? Uh, some of my clients are good, close, personal friends over many decades. And it's because, and I like working with them because I like them. Personally, the same thing needs to be for you. Uh, finally, remember that it's your vision that drives this. It's your client base that drives this. And just because you could get some beautiful work, like some of these things that are the signature uh, works of some of the architects in the previous slide, that's really probably secondary to making sure that you absolutely have what you need, first and foremost. Um, construction supervision is a lot of times people think, oh, I can get rid of that. It's a service you can't quickly lose. Remember that um, architects with 20 and 30 years experience have had a lot of experience in the construction industry and can catch a lot of problems before they start. Flexibility for the future is absolutely key, so making sure that you have an eye to that is, uh, is critical and it's really an important part of the, the work that you'll be doing with an architect. And remember that the architect, as well as yourself, is an agent of change, that they are there to help you transition that and you should be able to rely on them to be able to provide that for you. So uh, thank you so much for your time today and uh, it's a real privilege again to be here. Thank you very much, Chip. That was an excellent presentation. Um, in my next line, if I want to come back as, a, as an architect, uh, truly amazing. Although we turn to architects to start on projects like clinic and lab design, they in, they in turn receive professional advice from others. They look for building engineers, but particularly mechanical engineers to put air handling in place in the IVF lab. So we in turn, have turned to Tucker Matthews, whose bio is available on our site. He has been involved in numerous IVF projects. Tucker is a licensed mechanical engineer from Richmond, Virginia, and has a background in healthcare, laboratory, and clean room facility design. So very much looking forward to your talk, Tucker. Um, so take it away, Marianne, please. Hi, my name is Tucker Matthews. I'm a mechanical engineer with WSP. Uh, here in Richmond, Virginia. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, some different air quality uh, technologies available for um, the IVF lab environment um, and how they relate to both uh, new construction um, and renovation and uh, retrofit projects. So there's a number of different ways to keep laboratory air clean. Um, and when I say clean, I'm I'm specifically talking about uh, VOC and airborne particle uh, contamination reduction. Um, so I'm going to go into these in, in detail uh, in this presentation, but I'm going to talk about uh, pressure control in the lab, uh, carbon and uh, potassium permanganate filtration, uh, HEPA filtration, UV light. Um, those four are, are pretty widely used in the in the IVF and the healthcare space currently. Um, and uh, active particle control is a newer technology that I think has a, a really good fit in the in the IVF environment. Um, and then air quality monitoring and some of the uh, some of the feedback and, and energy savings benefits that can be had with that. So pressure control. Um, we're primarily going to use air pressure control uh, or room pressure control to try and stop the intrusion of contaminants uh, into the lab from adjacent spaces. And we do that by maintaining a positive pressure within the lab. Um, positive pressure is where you provide more supply air than is going to be returned by the HVAC system. So uh, that, that difference between supply and return is going to flow out of the lab um, under the door and um, you know, through penetrations in the walls and that sort of thing, just to keep clean air flowing into the lab 
and uh, keep dirty air from, from uh, coming into the lab from adjacent spaces. Um, so here on the, uh, on the left is a, uh, an air valve. Typically, we're going to use these on the supply and return in the, uh, in the HVAC system to be able to uh, track and, um, and uh, modulate to keep positive pressure within the room. And there's uh, there are some really nice digital pressure monitors available um, that uh, that would be wall mounted um, and can display temperature, air change rate, humidity, and room pressure, um, and that sort of thing. So to target gas phase contaminants. Um, Typically, we're going to use uh, a blend of carbon and potassium permanganate um, uh, granular media inside the air handling unit, and this is going to this is going to go after gas phase contaminants like VOCs, uh, which is going to include aldehydes, nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, ethylene, toluene, ozone, chlorine, uh, just to name a few. Um, but these are these are going to be uh, gas phase contaminants that when they flow over this granular media, this blend of carbon and potassium permanganate, uh, this, this chemical media is going to absorb these gases um, into the media. And um, it, can, it'll, it will fill up with, uh, with VOCs and not be able to absorb any more at a certain time. Um, so when this is applied, um, it's important to, to first test uh, do test samples of this media and send it to a test lab uh, to see how quickly um, this filter media needs to be changed out. And then, and then come up with a maintenance plan and follow that maintenance schedule. It's also really important to apply this technology in a constant temperature location um, within the air handling unit. And, uh, and by that I mean uh, typically that's going to be downstream of the cooling coil. So um, that, that's going to that's gonna keep this media at a constant temperature. So, so what that does is this, this media behaves differently under different temperature and humidity conditions. So if it's loaded up with VOCs and about ready to get changed out and there's a big spike in temperature humidity, um, it can actually off gas and dump a lot of those contaminants back into the airstream, which will be going into the lab space, which is, which is not what we want. So it's, it's critical to apply this filtration technology properly. So, and again, that was for targeting gas phase contaminants. To go after uh, uh, small particles down to 0.3 microns in size within the airstream, uh, typically we're gonna use HEPA filtration. Um, and these are gonna be best applied in a ceiling diffuser application. Um, on the right here you can see this is an exploded view of a ceiling diffuser and you have the HEPA filter that is pressed into the diffuser frame um, and then you have your perforated face uh, that would be exposed to the actual lab. Um, so the benefit of putting these in a ceiling diffuser um, is, as opposed to inside the air handling unit, you have a lot more uh, square footage of uh, a filter area. So what that means is you're going to have a lot lower air velocity flowing over these filters. Um, low air velocity equates to low pressure drop, and low pressure drop means you end up with energy savings because it takes less horsepower to drive that the fans in the air handling system. It's also going to cause these to last longer because you've got more filter media if you have these in every diffuser within the lab. Um, you can expect to get three to ten years of filter life out of a out of a HEPA filter, uh, just depending on the installation. And it's also best to install a MERV 14 filter upstream of the HEPA filter in order to extend the filter life of the HEPA filter. And and that will that will basically use the MERV 14 filter to get uh, larger particles out of the airstream and allow the HEPA filter to only target uh, small particles down to 0.3 microns. So again, that's for this. This is going to be for targeting airborne particle contaminants uh, within the HVAC system airstream. So ultraviolet light is commonly used 
to target viable pathogens, bacteria, fungus, viruses. Um, and usually this is going to be applied in the air handling unit itself. Um, you can see here on the right, you have a, an array of uh, UV lights that are installed on the face of the cooling coil in the air handler. And typically this is where they're going to be installed because the cooling coil uh, dehumidifies the air coming into the lab. So it has moisture uh, on it for um, you know most of the warmer months out of the year. And viable pathogens like a, a wet environment to grow. So putting UV light on the cooling cool keeps it clean and uh, keeps it disinfected. You can also install UV lights within the supplied ductwork um, and that will disinfect the entire airstream. Uh, that does take up quite a bit of space because pathogens require enough exposure time and intensity um, for UV light to render them non-viable. Um, UV light is also harsh on plastics, uh, porous plastics and foam materials. Um, it'll, so where it's applied has to be uh, taken into consideration so that the UV light doesn't uh, destroy other parts of the air conditioning system. And it's also harmful um, to your skin and your eyes, so it shouldn't be applied where there are going to be building occupants. And those four are uh, pressure control, carbon filtration, HEPA filtration, and UV light are, are really common, um, commonly applied in the IVF lab uh, and in hospitals and healthcare. Um, this one is a newer technology, which, uh, which is becoming a lot more popular in, in the hospital environment. And it has a, it'll, I think it has a pretty good, uh, pretty good fit within the IVF lab. So, and it's going to go after small particles less than 2.5 microns uh, in the actual in the actual lab, not within the airstream itself. So the problem we have is if you look at this distribution of particle size, um, these are 0.3 micron particles uh, and larger. So we have a lot more small particles. Uh, within an air sample of any, any given space, really, you're going to have a much higher concentration of really small particles uh, than you are going to have of larger particles. So the other, the other thing we're battling is small particles are a lot more affected by electromagnetic forces and Brownian motion than they are by the airflow of the HVAC system. So really large particles are going to be able to get drawn back into the system to get filtered out much easier than small particles are. And we have a much higher concentration of small particles within the lab. So you can end up with uh, high concentrations of small particles just suspended uh, within the space itself. So how do we tackle this problem? So this, this active particle control technology it imparts an electrostatic charge on larger particles that pass through uh, the air conditioning system. And uh, what this does is um, when these larger particles flow into the lab, um, it'll cause small particles that are suspended in the air to rapidly clump together. And once they do that, they, they start to behave like larger particles, which means they can get drawn back into the air conditioning system and, uh, and get filtered out. So this is a this is a, a case study from I believe a a surgery center in Lake Tahoe um, on two two operating rooms that were adjacent to one another. This one on the left, um, you can see the particles um, within the space are are much higher. This is this is counts of 0.4 micron and larger particles per cubic foot um, over time. So this and this this has a pre-filter, a MERV 14 filter, and a HEPA filter, which is going to be pretty typical for an operating room. The operating room that had the secure air uh, active particle control technology installed on it, just with a pre-filter and a secure air system, the actual particle readings within the space uh, were much lower. Um, you can see a 96% reduction in in particles 0.4 microns and larger. Um, so 
that just goes to show how effective this technology is at actually removing small particles from the space itself. And this is going to be suitable for uh, new construction and retrofits. Um, it has a low air pressure drop, so it, um, you know you're, you're typically not going to have to upgrade your fans much in order to account for this additional filter. Um, and it can also replace an, a standard MERV 14 uh, filter bank within the air handling system or ductwork. Um, it only has a nine inch depth where a typical MERV 14 filter is going to have uh, you know, up to 12 inches of depth. So it can be a direct replacement for that. So air quality monitoring. Um, this technology has been around for a while, but there are a few ways we can use it, um, especially within the, the lab space. So um, AirQuity is a company that makes this, this system and it'll measure and trend uh, total VOCs and airborne particle levels uh, within the space. Um, so why would we trend this data? Well, it'll help us to verify that the air handling system is is doing its job in removing VOCs using the other uh, the other um, technologies that we've talked about and those airborne particle contaminants, um, and and we can actually use this data to allow the air handling system to react to rising or falling contaminant levels. Um, we can also use it to help us understand why and when uh, we're having spikes in in VOC levels within the space. So say you know say you are trending all this data and at, at 8 p.m. every day, um, you have this huge spike in VOCs. So what do you do? You go to the lab and at 8 p.m. and see what's happening and, and someone's using a, a cleaner that they shouldn't be using um, you know, on the surfaces within the lab. So it's, it can be extremely useful to, um, to modify how the lab operates procedurally and, and um, understand how the use of the lab is um, is contributing to the air quality within the lab. Um, so if we if we use this technology to uh, to you know as an input to the air conditioning system um, to allow the air handling system to react to these contaminant levels, um, you can see this graph on the top here. This is going to be your your VOC levels over time, and then on the bottom is going to be your your uh, airflow rates over time corresponding to these these VOC levels. So you can see, um, you know, as there's a spike in VOC levels, this air handling system is going to react and increase airflow um, to quickly flush out those contaminants. And then once the contaminants are gone, you know that that airflow can can go back down because it doesn't need to be at full flow if there's no if there's no contaminants. Um, so this this represents a massive energy savings. Um, typically for labs, um, just in general, you could be looking at a 40 to 60 percent energy reduction um, within the lab space for the air conditioning system, uh, which is a, a, a huge savings every year. Um, so we're getting feedback, um, you know, as, as in terms of how we're using the lab and how that's affecting air quality, and we're uh, we're saving energy and saving money. And this is just a study that uh, Yale University did um, to demonstrate the relationship between air change rate and uh, flushing out contaminants within the lab. So they took one and a half liters of acetone and spilled it over a one square meter floor area in a 200 square foot lab um, at different air change rates. So this this top peak up here peaked around 20 25 parts per million at about 20 minutes um, and that's at six air changes per hour um, so you can see as the air change uh, rates increase we're we're getting a, a big decrease in the height of that peak as well as the recovery time from the spill um, so you know, you can see at 16 air changes, you're only peaking around nine parts per million, and then your your peak is you know 10 minutes. By 20 minutes, you're back down to uh, you know two or three parts per million, whereas that's where your peak was at six air changes. So 
Um, you know, you could run the lab at, at very high air change all the time, um, but you might not need to if, if uh, you know, contaminant levels are typically, you know, regardless of your air change rate, they're going to be low. Uh, if there's no no spills or no contamination, like at, at night, for example, where there's nobody in the lab. Um, but you can control your system to react to uh, contaminant levels. So say your baseline was six air changes, for example, and then you detected, um, you know, one or two parts per million of contamination. You could then increase air changes up to to be able to react and, and curb that contamination. Um, and then and then throttle it back down. So that's that's where the big energy savings comes from. So I appreciate you taking the time today to to hear about these different air quality uh, technologies and how they relate to the IVF lab. Um, if you have any questions um, or or want to look at a specific lab, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email. It's listed right here. Um, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Tucker. That was an informative presentation. So many technical possibilities to think about. Um, so now we have the space, we have the budget, we've got an architect here, one or two engineers, but what next? Closing the series of our presentations today is Jacques Cohen, speaking on behalf of Antonio Gilligan. What's his talk? Well, it's construction and renovation supervision. Jacques Cohen is a reproductive biologist, laboratory product developer, and high complexity laboratory director. As, as you probably know also, he's the founder, he's one of the founding members of this great project that we call the International IVF Initiative. His work on air quality with Antonio Gilligan really started the ball rolling. It was one of the um, ways that we first started to look at this um, question of VOCs, air handling, and lab design uh, in the late 90s. So over to Jacques, thank you very much. Thank you, Charles, for the introduction, and also thank you, uh, all three speakers, for um, making lab design uh, comprehensible and, and, and easy to understand. Of course, it's a major thing, and now you have done the design, you have done, you're ready to do the construction, you have a construction team assembled. Now, what are you going to do next? You can't run, so you have to stay around, because this is very important. It's if mo it may be the most important phase in the entire process of building a new IVF laboratory. Now you have to stick around. Uh, I'm presenting a, a short lecture from Antonia Gilligan, who unfortunately is in a very remote location in this pre-recorded session in uh, the Adirondacks in Northern New York. And she has very, very poor bandwidth. So I'm recording this uh, lecture for her. Um, and uh, it's about laboratory construction supervision or renovation. Mm -hmm. So she, she has one potential conflict of interest. She is the president and shareholder of Alpha Environmental, which is specialized in, in laboratory assessment, particularly IVF assessment, uh, and looking at uh, uh, whether uh, uh, spaces are suitable, whether they need improvement in terms of volatile organic compound removal or aldehyde, whether the spaces are appropriately designed or complete new, new construction. So this particular presentation is about construction supervision. I'm one of her clients and I've been, uh, I've been uh, using her services since 1997. Uh, the historical context was already provided to you by several of the speakers before me. You know, um, if you go back 25, 30 years, laboratory has high LDAT contacts and high volatile organic compounds. The only thing is we didn't know that until 1996, the paper we published in 1997, together with Antonia, we found out that aldehydes and VOCs were very high, particularly in incubators. And so um, um, there were all sorts of issues, low pressurization, uh, the use of particle board in adjacent spaces, not necessarily in our laboratory, but in adjacent spaces that would leak through the, through the system into the, the laboratory. Not enough overpressure, no central VOC removal technology. We did have filters. We did have active carbon and even potassium permanganate, but that, that was too late. It had to be centralized. Uh, uncontrolled relative humidity was another issue that also other laboratories showed. Uh, no physical isolation from the surroundings. That was really the biggest, biggest finding. And so anything from adjacent offices or adjacent medical spaces would leak into, in our, you know, in our uh, precious IVF laboratory space. 
Uh, now you would think, since this is 25 years ago, that things would have improved. Well, they have. We have a better understanding. We still have a lot of questions, as Giles pointed out, but we have a better understanding. Uh, but we st a lot of practices and a lot of administrators perhaps still fail to consider the requirement of the total space when you build a new IVF clinic or a new IVF lab. Uh, you need a dedicated HVC system just for the IVF lab. You cannot really share with other spaces. Uh, you have to keep in mind that there are ancillary spaces necessary, not just cryo storage, but other spaces as well. So you have to plan properly and not in hindsight, try to expand those ancillary spaces. Uh, you, you, you need to keep in mind that uh, there needs to be backup equipment. For instance, you have, if you have a bottleneck, and you have only one piece of equipment, that's crucial. Try to get a second piece at a minimum. Uh, contemporary IVF laboratories, uh, the requirements there in terms of air handling have been provided by the Cairo consensus meeting. Um, low levels of volatile organic compounds, less than 500 microgram per cubic meter in total VOCs, aldehydes. Now, all these requirements, high pressure, positive pressure, it has to pass an isolation test. I'll come back, I think, later uh, in that in the talk. No air leaks, and you don't want to use a drop ceiling. Then the air, air, the air handling system, the requirements are that you have to have a very stable uh, climate. And, and, and the reason for that is that we all know the culture system is essential for our success rate. And so if the stability of the lab is not guaranteed, that will affect the success rate. So your temperature has to be in a narrow range. You have to have relative humidity, it has to be in a narrow range. You have a chemical filter that has to have a long residence time. Uh, residence time means how long is the air that's pushed through the ductwork staying in the chemical filter. Uh, 0.25 is what we think is an appropriate number. That doesn't sound very long, but it actually is pretty long. And, and the longer you make it, the better it gets, but also the more expensive it gets, okay? Chemical filter needs to consist of 50-50 ratio of activated carbon and potassium and manganate. Uh, others are using other products and also different ratios. So this is not set in stone. You have to have a clean interior and no, you can't use mineral oil rust inhibitors in the ductwork. Must have, you must have sufficient heating and cooling capacity because of when all is said and done and you've removed all the fears he's almost all of it and you're back to zero basically uh, if you if if the temperature changes all the time and the humidity cannot be co controlled and the cooling doesn't work well and the heating doesn't work well then you don't have a good system so keep in mind the idea of an hvc system is that it also appropriately balances and stabilizes heating and cooling during construction, the requirements are that the construction site has to be super clean. You have to have sealed walls and penetrations. You can't leave anything open. Uh, you want to have clean ductwork to remove mineral oil from the ductwork. You want to have ductwork sealed. You don't leave things inside. So if it arrives clean or you have cleaned it, don't put it in a storage place or somewhere in a hallway before you put it in the ductwork. Okay, it has to be isolated and sealed. Before you, before you use it, maybe weeks later or even months later. Uh, you use inert silicone, plaster mud, and sheet rock. Uh, those are the, the, the three that will work well. Uh, you want to do detailed chemical and physical testing. You want to burn in period of at least 14 days. That's a minimum at 30 degrees centigrade. That's about equivalent to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. 14 days minimum. Sounds like a long time. It isn't. The longer you can make this, the better it is. Uh, because even if you've gone through all the MSDS sheets of all the construction materials that you have collected, even then, the longer that be a burning period, the better it is. You want to do it with all the equipment inside. Okay, you don't want to get the equipment in later. Um, the gas supply, let's talk about that for a few minutes, uh, either copper or stainless steel, medical grade copper or medical grade stainless steel. Uh, if you use copper, you just have to have a silver solder test because it's the solder that's the problem, not necessarily the copper. Uh, so medical gas lines. Gas lines should be oil-free, copper or stainless steel. Uh, that's, that's preferable, there are alternatives for that as well, but th that those are the ones that Antonia prefers. Copper tubing must be brazened with silver solder without flux, and testing that is required, uh, testing the solder is required. Compression fitting for stainless steel. Um, the pressure testing of finished lines have to, has to reach 100 PSI over 24 hours. You don't want to drop in that. Certification by medical gas firm once that is done. So you need to get a 
a piece of paper that basically says it's now certified. And, the, and you wanna use inline medical gas filters from coming from the gas supply, coming from the oxygen and the CO2 um, from nitrogen lines. Um, you, want, you wanna have medical gas filters that are readily available from different companies in line and try to use them vertically, not necessarily horizontally. Uh, lighting, you want the mount fixtures on the hard deck so that you only have one penetration from an electrical line, nothing else. Seal all junction and switch boxes with silicon gel. Uh, that, that's uh, not an easy job. It needs to be done carefully by a specialist. Seal all junction and switch boxes with improved styrofoam gasket. And any UV application should not release ozone. The construction audits are essential because you may have audits at different periods of time. Uh, or you will have audits at different periods of time, and, and, and you can't go necessarily back in time if, if something wasn't seen, um, something uh, that wasn't paid attention to. This can be done by, this could be done by a little group. The architect or somebody from the architect firm should always be there. Um, the, the head of con construction, the contractor needs to be there. Maybe one or more subcontractors. You need to be there. And if you have somebody like Antonia, that'd be great too. Somebody with experience in building RTF labs, that person needs to be there too. You wipe the samples of the ductwork, you do visual inspections on walls and ceiling that are already in place. You do visual inspection of the gas lines. And, uh, and as I said, you only, you only get this, uh, you have to get this right. So it's an important process to do audits. Uh, the common errors that occur during your construction are using incorrect materials with high VOC release, like using oil-based paint, um, uh, not using compression for door caskets, including clean ductwork, uh, which are stored unsealed, unchecked outlets and switches, they need to be sealed. Uh, uh, the, the, the lighting needs to be mounted on the hard deck, as I said before, so you only have one hole for the electrical line. The final testing that has to occur, all penetrations have to be sealed with, e with either silicon gel or plaster mud. You burn them for a period of 40 days, that's a minimum. The air balance medical gas reports need to be available. All IVF equipment has to be in the lab before you did the burn in, so the burn in occurs with that equipment in place. The IVF lab during the burn in has to be pressurized. And finally, IVF sleep, you need to clean everything with uh, HEPA vacuum, low VOC detergent, no alcohol preferably, and hydrogen peroxide. The commissioning, the final commissioning that basically after that is done, you're then ready to start clinical procedures. There's a list here of different tests uh, that are done in the United States, in your country that may be different. Um, you do a particle counting test, and Tony prefers to do two, one for bacteria and virus sized particles, and one for larger particles like molds. Um, and so that she, she does, she prefers to do two counting tests. Uh, you do an isolation test with an, uh, with an inert man-made gas called SF6, and SF6 is released outside the lab space, and then if you pick it up in the lab um, with infrared detectors, you pick it up in the lab, that's a problem, depending on the level. You may have picked up some, but a lot is not a good thing. It means that there are holes and that there, there, there's air filtration, there's air penetration. And you have to look also at the fresh air ventilation rate and that's it uh, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacques, for wrapping up the presentations. That's excellent. Um, let's now go to Q and A, if we may. Um, I think I'll start if that's okay and I'll, I'll Go to Chip, I think. We'll ask him a not so technical question at the start. Um, can you tell him, we've got a question here. How, how often should the client um, be there during the construction period? I think the client needs to be there practically on a weekly basis. Um, the more they're involved, the more they see, the more they understand the issues that are going on in construction and they don't just rely on everyone else. And I think they bring a unique perspective to the to the process. Thank you, thank you very much. And one for Tucker. It's by Fernando Mondeya. I hope I've said that correctly. Um, how can um, carbon filters be 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 analysed for exhaustion, and and how often should they be changed? Which leads to the question: Is in general, how can we test our filters themselves, and, and what's the general rule about when we change the filters? Sure, so uh, carbon filters, what, you, what you'll typically do is take a small sample of that granular filter media 
and uh, send it in a sealed container to uh, the filter manufacturer or a test lab, which is recommended by that manufacturer. And they will analyze it for uh, absorption of specific compounds um, and VOCs. Um, and then you, what you would do is come up with a maintenance schedule based on that data to uh, interpolate and determine at what point those filters will be at maximum capacity. You would then change them at a, a, a conservative point uh, before you would meet, reach maximum filter loading. Okay, thanks. Um, there are several questions for you, Charles, quite a few. Um, question from Dara Berger. What do high levels of VOC affect first and most in an embryology lab, if, we, if you know it? Uh, and, and it's a good question because you're an embryologist. Uh, do they affect fertilization, embryo utilization, pregnancy, biochemical rate, or something else? Right. Um, well, of course, it can affect um, a number of things. And in the early days, we just had the like, anecdotal. And the, and the anecdotal was, um, you know, like a nearby car park was being tarmacked. Um, and we had terrible, uh, you know, embryos with fragmentation or even exhaust um, of your generator. Perhaps you have your generator and it's too close to your air intake. So there's lots of ways that it can go in there. But what does it actually affect? Um, those papers I showed you in my slide, some have looked at clinical pregnancy rates, some, some have looked at fragmentation. The one by Wang looks at that. But the more severe um, the VOC, that'll affect um, some of the most. And um, Akuja, if I said his name correctly, showed that the VOCs can affect the fertilization, um, of course, the embryo development, and going up to blastocyst rate as well. So the first thing I would say is to look at your fertilization rate. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. A question for Chip. Um, Chip, how efficient is it to hire a regular architect? I presume that is someone who is not specialized in medical laboratories or medical spaces. Uh, uh, someone without any medical lab or OR experience. How, how, is, that, is that a good thing to do? Can they learn? Can they learn this job? Um, I actually think IVF is a subspecialty of medical, which is a subspecialty of architecture. And, and to, uh, you should at least hire a person who's familiar with medical work simply because of all the technical interlacing with the engineering and, um, and also the codes requirement. Um, IVF falls just outside of most of the codes, at least in the United States and in many of the other places in the world, simply because it isn't quite, it's neither fish nor fowl. You're not quite anesthetizing patients to the degree that starts to create problems for surgical centers, as an example. So having a medical architect that can sort of walk that uh, code line in that specific location is really helpful. And then if that person has IVF experience or doesn't have IVF experience, you can supplement it with someone who does. And it, it doesn't have to be an expensive pro process to have someone cons consulting just purely to, to handle the IVF portion of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm gonna turn back the question back onto Jacques just now. Um, how important is the andrology room, would you say? as far as looking at VOCs? Yeah, that's a question we hear, hear often. Um, and, and, and frankly, I, I, I think you hinted at this in the beginning of your lecture and during your lecture, that, that there are things we know, but a lot of things we don't know. And so on, on andrology and spermatozoa, what are the effects of ethanol on spermatozoa? What are, what are the effects on pentane on spermatozoa? We really don't know. The toxicology isn't done, and that, that's a complex, un, complex undertaking anyhow. What are the circumstances? Um, you get, the, of course, the, the good thing about spermatozoa is you can use human spermatozoa for your experience, but then they're very short. And does that have consequences? To, does that particular product have consequences for further embryo development or fertilization? So there's a lot we don't know. I think you probably just have to be a little defensive about the andrology lab and sperm preparation. I mean, sperm is, uh, after all, Part of this whole procedure. So yeah, I would extend. I would extend into the andrology lab if, depending if, if that's possible, but or uh, have the air go into the andrology lab if it's adjacent and push it out from the andrology lab, and that makes it clean enough. I mean, that's that's one way to get around it and not have it maybe in the andrology lab specifically or separately. So if it's exactly next to the embryology lab, you can push it into andrology 
and then and then you 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 have a bonus basically. So I hope I hope that answers the question. And um, one of the interesting things also is the relationship between um, cryo storage and andrology and the lab, and how do you balance the air and how do you deal with it, these three elements uh, together? Because hopefully you have access, direct access, without having to use a transfer doer to go back and forth. Um, so it's helpful in the planning aspects to try and get them proximal to each other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the question about andrology always comes up. Uh, and it's often an afterthought, and it may be at the end of a hallway, and then it becomes a problem. I think if it's really separate, I do think you need air handling. I don't know what Tucker thinks about this, but, but I do think you, need, to, you need, to, need an air handler to take care of the andrology lab. may not have the same, same requirements, the same specifics, but I do think you need a system. Yeah, typically we've seen um, we've seen them in close proximity to the IVF lab, um, and it's also I think a good practice just to uh, try to keep all of the spaces that are immediately adjacent to the IVF lab treat those um, with the same respect that you would treat the IVF layer air in terms of VOC and particulate removal. Um, that's just going to help to keep the IVF lab uh, cleaner at the end of the day. Yeah, sure. It's I mean, and you know, and again, the carbon consensus doesn't really you know, let's stipulate, and also the regulations don't. Obviously, you could say that the sperm preparation is, is more fleeting and embryo culture is, is more longer term, but then it gets complicated because it's, it's exactly where do you draw the line between your lab and construction, but perhaps not so stringent, but again, it's, it's, if it's still in the same bubble, which it should be, then of course we have to pay attention to those rules about adhesives and what kind of material by which we used. Um, I throw out to all three of you um, a question about VOC meters. There's a lot of questions about that. Some are saying which are the best ones. Some are saying what's the cheapest way to do it. Um, could I just have your opinion um, on on some of the VOCs and and the plus and minuses? Um, I'll start with Jacques, I think. Well, yes. So there are two approaches, right? Are the handhelds or the build-ins, which uh, which uh, Tucker has about you know uh, assessed and uh, presented. I mean, so those, those uh, generally uh, work on the parts per million. And if you look at the papers that have been published on facts on VOCs and aldehydes in mice, uh, that was always done in parts per billion. And, and the reason why, why VOC handhelds or buildings are in parts per million, well, the, the, the technology is, makes it affordable, uh, first of all, but also it, it, it parts per million is when you, you we, when you think about humans as as the product that could be affected, whereas we of course think about gametes and embryos, which is totally different. They have no lungs, they have no skin, they have no kidney, no liver, they have no protection whatsoever, no immune system, and so you, you, the likelihood is that at a parts per million, an individual compound may not may not have a, a, a visible effect in a human, but it may on an embryo. We know very little about this. So, so Antonia would say parts per billion is the endpoint you want to know when you want to have specifics of what particular aldehyde of VC is wrong. But, but she would also acknowledge that, for instance, what Tucker presented, where you have to build in units one before, uh, before uh, uh, the duct work and one after the filters, in the, either in the duct work or the lab. So or one before in, in a space outside the lab in a hallway and one inside the lab. And then that differential, I think though that visual that he presented was very convincing. So and that's parts per million on both sides, before and after parts per million. And I think you because parts per million, it, the analysis that he showed, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that was about total VOCs. And that's a great endpoint. So if you if you look at total VOCs and you're not going into specifics, um, I, I I think parts per million is fine. And then you now, what, 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 which one to buy and which one to install? I leave that to Chip and Tucker. Uh, I, 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 I really haven't tested them side by side, uh, and I don't know how they have to be calibrated, or, or uh, I don't know about individual expenses. But of course, that's a lot more affordable than doing um, uh, doing regular VOC and aldehyde testing, doing uh, gas chromatography in mass spec, which is also slow. You don't have an immediate endpoint. That actually is the problem I have with the more refined old-fashioned technology that looks specifically at peaks of individual compounds. Um, the, process, the process of going through um, initial testing to get the baseline uh, and doing a very high quality test and then doing it after construction and then a number of weeks after that 
is mm -hmm. sort of a minimum amount of testing that you should be doing, even if you're trying to save money. A lot of times um, having a, a consultant uh, just on board to, to handle your air quality is, is an expense that you can't afford. I've worked on Antonia projects and non-Antonia projects. And uh, we always recommend for those sort of baselines to be, to be meted out, particularly also in midsummer when there may be more air pollutants available uh, due to the heat, the exterior heat. And that of course changes in the Southern hemisphere. So um, we're talking about the, the, the hottest point in the year. Um, and, and, and finally, just um, the, the ability to be able to uh, detect that and throttle down actually saves you money. So the process of, of, of testing and responding uh, and using at least a, a fairly accurate uh, system to be able to throttle the whole system down to six air changes versus 30 air exchanges uh, represents a significant saving over the life cycle and actually will save you a great deal of money after the fact. So over designing it and just running it at high, uh, at high output is quite expensive also. Yeah. So um, Charles, on that same topic, a question for you here from Liesl Meltemat. Right. What is the biggest generator of VOCs in the lab that can be easily eliminated? What about, and here, here comes her question really, what about cosmetics? and pens and markers. Are those really an issue? Well, it would be for me. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that you would ask that question. I mean, um, are the most serious, you know, and the most easy to get rid of from the lab would be you know, anything which is movable, you can get it out of the lab as quick as possible. I mean, we're talking about uh, MDF, um, you know, Formica, old style furniture. So again, as, as, as we all mentioned in our talks, we should have, um, you know, the stainless steel or the inert kind of furniture in the lab. So anything like adhesives, they're, they're going to be, they're going to be almost impossible to get out, you know, and these are the silent killers, you know, if you've got some wall adhesives, or, or some oil based paints, they're going to be um, off gassing, or they're going to be emitting these VOCs, you know, forever. Um, people always say about, you know, you know, cosmetics, can you, can you wear or not? Well, of course, a lot of them have got alcohol based. Um, I would tend to avoid that. Um, of course, you've got the pens, which really smell quite badly with this, you know, you know, felt pens you use. I've always used uh, like China marker, and it's the and it's the closeness to the product as well. So there are there are sort of ways around that. Um, the elephant in the room, and sometimes it's not spoken about, is of course the operator who's the biggest uh, contaminant. And for good or for worse, if people smoke, um, we have people in clean room companies. Who, who don't employ who don't employ smokers and um, the actual tar particles. I don't know if if Turka could eliterate, but it's but it stays in the air for for a long time. Indeed, you know it, you know the size of that stays in there. Yeah, yeah. If I, if I could just uh, Antonio, I've asked these questions to Antonia that Lisa asked you, and 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 years ago she said, well, our noses, the human nose, is very sensitive on a parts per billion level not parts per million. So we tend up to pick up cosmetics and eau de cologne and bad smells too, very, very well, with exception. Uh, so our noses are incredible machines. And so she is not that worried about cosmetics. Um, um, but in the case of pants, that's a different story because that, that is, those have really uh, many artificial products in, in them. But cosmetics, if we smell cosmetics and it's just, a, a puff of air, I think it probably isn't so bad. But if it's overwhelming and you smell it when the person is gone, I think then, then it's maybe time to say something about it. It's a difficult subject. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, how are we for time? Should we, can I have a couple more questions? Absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd I like think... to, um, we haven't really touched on the cryo room, you know, at all. And there's a lot of debates on um, what should be in a cryo room, um, how to design it, where it should be. Um, Chip, do you want to start us off on that? Oh boy. Um, wow. The uh, cryo room I've been taking a, a crash course on over the last uh, two or three years, uh, just because cryo processes have, have ramped up so much. And, um, and now how much space do you actually allow for that? Um, there's a real balancing act between how much space you can afford to build into, particularly in an urban situation 
and for, for pure storage and how much you can afford to have that and also the just the level of exposure that you have with larger containers versus smaller containers. So um, balancing that process is, is part of, I guess, the art of, of engineering these things correctly. And more and more long-term storage is becoming a major financial uh, issue for, for IBF labs. So um, eventually, very soon, I think uh, large biorepositories are gonna become available with techniques that allow you to transport and offload them almost the way you would of a, a patient record in the old days. So uh, we used to, when we stored a lot of paper, had to keep paper records uh, in large areas directly in the middle of a medical area, uh, simply to make sure that you didn't lose information. And so likewise, uh, the, the frozen storage area is, is critical that way as well. So the ability then to, to utilize uh, what you need in short term and then offsite to other locations will be increasingly possible in, in a safe manner that doesn't expose the Achilles heel of an IVF center. Sure, and, and of course the safety aspects as well, you know, how much uh, can you keep in one space as well? I think there's a, there's a good equation which um, I think people should really have a look at to see um, how many Jewish you can have in, in actual space. Uh, the, obviously, the larger the space is, uh, the better air exchange you get to, to stop that threat. But That's right. um, That's right. having proper detection in the space is absolutely important, obviously, to, to, for, for safety. Um, and it's, it's uh, having worked with uh, IVF professionals for so long, I, I really wasn't as aware as I have been lately that... Uh, Nitrogen is a very dangerous <laughs> substance to have, and so to properly um, maintain all of the sealing and, and operations is really great. Um, infrared detection in that area is a new technology that's actually an ancient technology, an old technology, but it's being employed to show uh, failure in doers. And so by having a, a number of infrared cameras within the space, you can immediately see problems with uh, leaking in the doers which is a great thing that has happened in Cleveland and uh, San Francisco. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one last question from you, Jack, perhaps, before? I think he's muted. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. I'll, I'll ask, ask a last question. Um, um, David Morrill has a question for you, Charles. What equipment should be used to measure VOCs and how easy to test individual VOCs? Well, I think we went over that. I think yeah, I think, sure. I think, and, I think, and, we, I yeah. think we covered that. Um, yeah. So, but, but an important question is how does the incubator generate VOCs inside an IVF lab? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I mean, many ways. One is that you got VOCs in compressed gas, okay, which is one of your studies, of course, and that's why people came. Um, came to do the products which were the inline filters. Um, a lot of the equipment and incubators also, um, the, they don't come um, or, or already been off gassed or burnt out. And you can sometimes um, see it in the seal, you can sometimes smell that in the seals. So, of course, um, there's that aspect as well the actual equipment. And again, we've mentioned that we have to have all the equipment has to be burnt out before it goes into the, the lab. Um, the stagnant way that in the old big box incubators, the air wasn't circulated. And if we don't degas our, um, our dishes properly, okay, and of course that, that's another thing, um, uh, another topic where all the consumables should perhaps be um, you know, de degas from the polystyrene, the styrene smell that they have. So all these things together mean that you're accumulating that um, in the incubator. So, so I hope that, um, I hope that answers the question. And with that, before I get another difficult question, um, I'd like to um, thank everyone for taking part in this session. Uh, it's, been, it's been really interesting and this, uh, this question never goes away. I also, I'd like to especially thank um, our two speakers, Chip and Tucker, or T Tucker and Chip, um, and, and of course our moderator, JC here. Um, thank you to the organizing committee, to the initiative that we have, uh, first started by um, the, the uh, Peter Naj, Thomas Elliott, 
Shaistra Sajidan and Marianne Servetes, and of course our co-founder Jacques Cohen. There's a tremendous amount of work obviously that's been going on behind the scenes, a lot of questions we've had from this session, and I'd like to thank them all for helping um, in this huge effort, um, and of course to spend this time in this endeavour to educate uh, everyone in this lockdown period. Um, one of the most complicated elements of the webinars is the stream of questions which we have and the way that they are triaged. So I'd like to thank today's team, which was Dara Berger and Liesl Nell Tomat. So thank you again, and I'll, hold, I'll hand you over to the last bit to Jacques. Thank you, Charles. And thank you so much for being an organizer and putting this together. Uh, great job. I would like to encourage all of you in the audience to contact i3 if you would like to help and will help create or sub submit some website content or through our website or if you have any ideas about partnership or uh, propositions for uh, webinar sessions. So far over 15 embryology and science organizations have uh, pledged their support to us which is really wonderful. So please join us in two weeks from now on July 14, that's Tuesday, same time, same station for session 24. Now, why are we are waiting for 14 days? I think you can do without us for 14 days. But, but the reason why we wait is because next week is, of course, the annual meeting of Asheville. It starts on Sunday, the 5th of July, and it will last till the 8th. I think that's Wednesday. And um, um, we don't want you to miss any of that because we're setting up some, some webinar. Um, so we encourage you to go to the Asheville.eu website. You can sign on for free if you're an Ashford member. If you're not, you can become an Ashford member. Immediately on that website, you'll see how you can do that. It'll take a few minutes and then you will be free in that meeting. If you don't want to do that, but you want to be part of it, uh, it's a very low fee, relatively speaking. It's a very low fee, much lower than normal. So all of you, I think, uh, should take that opportunity because you can uh, you know, be in your own environment and, and take care of a major four-day long, including pre-courses, a four-day long Ashwin session. Um, so that's about Ashwin. Now, uh, on July 14, we'll see you back with the New England Fertility Society and the start of their annual uh, virtual meeting series. And this is part one. It's called Donor Anonymity and Confidentiality in the Area of Direct to Consumer DNA Testing and Social Media. So a lot of fireworks in that meeting and there are two fantastic speakers, Andrea Braverman and Susan Crocken. So that's on July the 14th. And the week after that, we have Alpha and Alpha meeting on this web webinar. And, uh, and what you will see more about that on our website. So uh, it was great having you. Uh, please be safe as always and see you soon. Thank you very much.